everyone. It's Stephanie again with a patient story back with Robin S who just shared so much. Robin, a quick recap, you described, um, you know, how you basically self-diagnosed, um, you know, diffuse large B cells, stage two with an E because extra nodal, um, all these little things you walked us through, um, you know, how it was to break the news to your family. And uh, you also delved into the RCHOP standard of care treatment and um, that you were in remission for four years. And that's where we left off. Mm -hmm. uh, you had stopped the follow-ups after two years, two years more go by, you've resumed life. And then what? And, um, and then unfortunately, uh, it's funny how you remember these things exactly. My husband and I were walking around at our backyard on our a different house than we're in now. We're in a smaller house, but uh, they had we're looking at the garden. I realized I had a large lymph node again in my back of my neck and I wasn't sick. And I immediately thought about lymphoma. And once again, my husband goes, ah, you're just, you're just all the, you're working too much. You, you see this all the time. It's probably nothing, but I made an appointment to see my oncologist because I felt this node and I had not been there before. And sure enough, CAT scans, PET scans, I had relapsed. And this time it was still stage two. Um, it was all, once again, all the lymph nodes were in my neck. Um, and I had one lymph node in my left arm kit, but it wasn't big. So um, I actually got several consults from where I live because I live at a major tertiary care center. And I called where I trained, uh, which is, where I did my medical school, which is another tertiary care center. And then I actually went to MD Anderson for a, so I, I got really three different consults and even a fourth, there was another, a consult was sent to Nebraska, which is an area of lymphoma, just because I had been out four years and it was unusual for me to relapse. And I didn't want to have a stem cell transplant. I had seen it. I just wanted to know what else I could have. And even back then I asked about natural killer cells because I'd been in the news, but there was nothing available. So everyone convinced me I needed to have a stem cell transplant. So I had two rounds of R ice, which is a much more intensive chemotherapy. They, it requires you to be in the hospital. The, um, the eye part of it is ugh, makes you feel really lousy. And then it, during the middle of the night, you have to eat ice cubes to prevent your mouth from getting all ulcerated. Um, and then I actually had to have uh, two rounds of intrathecal chemotherapy where they do a spinal tap and they put chemo into your spinal canal and have it go up to your brain because I had had the extra nodal site initially, they thought I should prevent from me getting CNS lymphoma, which was a good, which is a good recommendation from what I know. And then once that was complete, I went into remission. They actually took my stem cells out, which they do via something called apheresis, where they hook you up and they take cells from one arm and they filter them through a, um, a, a machine and then they take them out and they freeze them. And then you get in, admitted to the hospital for your actual stem cell transplant. And the stem cell transplant, they do myeloablation where they basically blast your bone marrow. There's different ways to do it. I had something called Dean. You can do it with total body radiation. There's some other protocols, but it's just horrible chemo. It totally obliterates your bone marrow. It leaves you with no white cell count and also a very high risk of infection. And at the point when you have had all your chemo, then they give you your stem cells back. So it's really a stem cell rescue. And then they wait for your stem cells to engraft in your bone marrow and start making new bone cell, like bone marrow cells, like blood cells and platelets. Until then they give you transfusions and um, you hope you don't get an infection because you don't have any white cell count. And of course I got an infection. So I ended up with septic shock. So I was in the intensive care unit um, and I was, uh, had a you know, fever 105, septic shot, my blood pressure was zero. I was on something called pressors just to keep my blood pressure up. In terms of septic shock in this situation, do you know ballpark? Is it very rare? Um, is it something that happens? It's pretty common. It's common. Uh, I, people get sick. Um, sometimes they don't get as sick as I did, um, but I wasn't intubated. I just had the high fever and I had a positive blood culture for what had happened is the line I had, even though they were using all septic technique had gotten infected and the central line, they took the line out and they gave me all these antibiotics. And I, I got 
better pretty quickly. And then I started my cells engrafted. I started making my own red blood cells, my own white blood cells. And honestly, I got out of the hospital in three weeks, which was pretty quickly. Um, but I was sick. I was really sick. Um, I don't remember some of it. My husband and people came to check on me. I was sort of out of it. Um, so it's, uh, Evidently, I argued with the ICU doctor about which presser to use, though, which I think is pretty funny. <laughs> I was totally out of it. And I'm arguing with the person who's an expert. I'm a radiologist and I'm telling them which presser I want, which I, they must have thought I was really obnoxious. But um, anyway, look, you get a you get a free pass or, or several free passes. OK, you, yeah, we'll put through the ringer and I'm sure they're yeah. used to it, um, which by well, the way, they probably aren't used to the bone marrow transplant patient arguing about the pressers which now I look back as sort of funny, but it, the bottom line is they took great care of me and I'm here and I'm alive. And then I went home and then you have to be very careful after a bone marrow transplant. Cause even though I had a few white cells, you're, you're likely to get an infection. You're not allowed to be around anybody. You can't, Oh, the worst was you can't eat berries. I love berries, like, you know, blueberries, strawberries, all that kind of stuff because of the skins you can't, couldn't have anything with skins. Um, you had to be very careful, no salads that weren't triple washed, all of that for a hundred days. And uh, in my present in a hundred days was then I had to go for head and neck radiation. Going from our ice uh, through the intrathecal chemo and then going through the actual, um, you know, infusion you know, out and then coming back in and then beam. Can you just take that step-by-step step and just summarize, well, here, here's what I learned for each or, or some guidance for people who are about to go through some of these things. So starting with our ice. Our ice is a very difficult chemotherapy for most people. It require it, it results in a lot of severe nausea, a lot of mouth ulcers. Uh, majority of people end up needing a bone marrow transplant, not about, need a um, blood transfusions afterwards. I did not, I was unusual. Um, I, you have to take the new Lasta new pigeon shots. Um, I was also able to work some during that, but I am, a, I'm really unusual. The intrathecal chemo was uncomfortable, but it wasn't any worse than our ice. Um, the, uh, the thing that was unusual is for me was getting the, um, the huge catheter that they had to use for the transplant, which is a trilumen catheter. And that one it goes in your neck. It's really, really big. I, you know, have a bigger scar from that than I do my port scars. Cause I've had two different ports, um, which I didn't go into much. So I've had ports every single time I've had two. And then I had this huge catheter. And then with this, you had to, the only way you could shower is you have to put plastic all over yourself. So you don't get this catheter wet. Um, it was, you know, it required some people with I would say medical knowledge, or at least some meta, they had to be instructed with directions and how to take care for a patient who has these things. So one of the bottom lines of people who, if you have a family member that's going through this, you're gonna to have to have somebody that either has some medical knowledge to start with, it's a nurse, or that is willing to undergo training um, and is not squeamish. Um, so that's, cause I could only do so much I, by myself. You're talking about because you have to flush it. Like what, 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 what goes into the care? Uh, a lot of it is just the care, the dressings around it are specially cared for. And then just to shower and stuff almost is, is a two person job because somebody has to wrap you in cellophane so you can go wash the rest of your body. So you don't get the scabbard or wet and, and your arms sore. So you can't really, it's hard to wash your hair. Um, you know, it was, uh, it's all very doable. But I think it's, it's overwhelming for people who have never been exposed to cancer treatment. And just like with the R ice, because it's a hospitalized chemo and a lot of people have blood transfusions and they're very, very sick afterwards. Uh, they're not able to eat. Um, it, it's just very difficult, I think, for the caregivers as well as the patients. Uh, very difficult. And then fast forward to the stem cell transplant, most people feel pretty lousy, not initially, but once you, your white counts low and you, in my case, I had a fever and everything. A lot of people have mouth ulcers. They can't swallow very well. 
it's very difficult for the family members to watch that. The nurses and the staff might give the patient pain meds. I know I had some narcotics when I was in the hospital. So some stuff I don't remember. And I'm glad I had narcotics. I have no problem. I mean, when you have pain, you take, take, take pain medicine. But I don't remember some of the stuff. And I know it was very difficult for my husband and my older son who were there at the hospital the most. Um, very traumatic for them. I'm so glad you're highlighting the piece about caregivers because we, we build this also for caregivers. Um, right. So many different roles and it is so difficult. And so thank you for, for spotlighting that, right. Robin. Um, you, you, you did summarize all these things um, about what you've gone through in that short period of time. Uh, the beam chemo after, anything to note about that before we talk about the head and neck radiation? <laughs> Um, beam chemotherapy is just miserable. Um, I think the worst thing is, is the, um, uh, the melphalan, the last part of it causes, I mean, quite frankly, really bad diarrhea. I mean, like, you know, dysentery diarrhea. Um, so that's standard. Um, it's just the way it is. So everyone survives it, but, um, wasn't pleasant. Right. No. And that's a, a real, I mean, I think different people in different chemos just because of what's going on, um, that happens a lot. And I'm so glad that you're pointing it out. I mean, it's just a fact, either it's constipation that's really extreme or diarrhea that's really right. extreme or both kind of fluctuating. And for you, it was the latter, um, anything other than just sort of taking some of the, what, what helped the most just taking medicate. I mean, some of the, the, the medications, I guess. I just, I, I, when I was there, they have a thing where you would walk the halls. Again, I'm a big exercise promoter proponent. And when you walk, it actually helps the stem cells and graft. So I followed the, whatever the nurses, I, I really can't, cannot reiterate. I did follow all my directions. And so the nurses say you need to walk. And if, even if you feel like total garbage, I'd be there with my little IV pole walking around, um, before I had the, all the beam, I was even on an exercise bike, but then once you've had the beam and you're really, really sick, it's very hard to do anything. Um, so, you know, there, the side effect of melphalan is sort of tough. It's, uh, a lot of my friends were in the Peace Corps in Africa and they said like, you know, you haven't really been the Peace Corps unless you've had diarrhea where you couldn't make it to the bathroom, um, which is, uh, uh, I always, I sort of said, Hey, I feel like I've been in the Peace Corps. <laughs> Honorary member. <laughs> Honorary member. <laughs> um, so, so I appreciate you being so open about that because a lot of this, I think is expectation setting for people that you may not go yeah. through this, but it's on the table for some. Yeah. Um, so then of course you get gifted another present of now head and neck radiation. And before we dive into the actual experience, Robin, could you set it up for us? Is that typical? I know it's dependent again on the patient, but why for you was this part of the process? Um, at MD Anderson, and actually even some people from Sloan Kettering, because I had relapsed late, but it had pretty much all been in my neck and even in my nasopharynx, they wanted to do something called consolidate the, um, the bone marrow transplant. And because I was young and healthy, they treated me extremely aggressively. So not everyone would be treated like this, but they wanted to save my life. Um, and I agreed. They said that if I had the head and neck radiation, it would um, increase my chance of survival up to 5%. Compare, I mean, it, it might, my chance of remission after bone marrow transplant was only about 35%. So with the head and neck radiation, they said, well, it might increase to 37 or 40. So, um, you know, it was our decision to proceed. It was the recommend, I followed the recommendation of all of the physicians. Can I ask really quickly, especially because you have this background as a trained physician, what went into that thought process really? Because for some people, they are thinking, well, this is beneficial in this way, but could it increase the chance of something else happening? What was that process? For my process at the time, I was just trying to stay alive. I was going to take my best odds. Now, you know, in retrospect, I wish I hadn't had the radiation, but at the time I had talked to the specialist and at some point you actually have to go ahead and have faith and believe in who you've consulted. And I've actually had consulted more than one doctor. And one thing I'll always tell people who have a life-threatening condition, particularly like mine, it is totally reasonable to get more than one opinion. Um, and that actually helped me because I had several institutions saying the same thing. And 
that I think was helpful. It's just been one institution. I don't know if I would be as comfortable. I love that. I love anytime there's the message of advocating for something, second opinion, even more than that, if it, if it, you know, doesn't feel right or right. You're dealing with something that's threatening your life. You should be able to ask for as many opinions as you need. Um, So then take us back into this uh, thought process was, okay, I just, I need to solve for now. Um, Can you describe the actual experience of it and guidance to other people who might be going through something like that? Well, head and neck radiation is, um, again, two thumbs down, do not recommend. (laughs) It's not fun, but you just do what you have to do. Um, I have a lot of friends who've had head and neck cancer and they've had to experience this. So head and neck radiation, um, in in most institutions, they have something called IMRT, which is a focused radiation therapy where they actually, in my case, they were focusing on where I'd relapsed on the side of my neck and then actually in my nasopharynx. And they actually can control the beams to a certain extent, to a certain extent. But there is something called scatter radiation. So no matter what, even as, even though it's controlled beams, you're going to get some scatter and some other side effects. So then they, they make a mold of your head. Um, I think I had sent you a picture of that. It looks unbelievable. Uh, but it's a whole mold of your head. And then you lay on the table and they literally screw you down to the table so you won't move. Um, and then they do the radiation. And in my case for lymphoma, Unlike head and neck radiation, lymphoma, they usually use a dose of about 30 to 35 gray. Meanwhile, with a head and neck cancer, they use double that dose, uh, 70, 75 gray. Uh, Head and neck radiation is very difficult. Um, For my radiation, I was supposed to have very few side effects because it was only over here. But unfortunately, I had a lot of side effects. Uh, I became... I had the mouth ulcers. Uh, I, I couldn't swallow solid food for almost five months after having head and neck radiation. Um, it affected my salivary glands. I didn't have, I, I just couldn't swallow. Um, it was uh, very difficult to eat anything. I literally survived on smoothies for about four months after that. And I was supposed to get like 36 treatments and then I ended up getting 30 because they just, titrated it down because I was, had so many symptoms. The other thing I I got is because of the scatter radiation, it got part of the base of my brain and I developed worse nausea than I'd had through any chemo. I vomited all the time. It was, it was terrible. Um, But, you know, again, I did what was recommended. I got the, the minimum dose that for consolidation and I just thought I could take it and I, I tried to be positive and I made a real effort. This is the other thing with people had integration to eat protein and try to keep my weight up the best I could. But to give you an example, um, I started with a BMI of 22 by the end of radiation. I think I was down to 15, 14, about 103 pounds. Um, so wow, you 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 did go through a lot in that in that in those months. I mean, you <clears throat> you couldn't eat anything. You also couldn't keep anything down because you were going oh, through horrible. with all this nausea. Um, by the way, you said that going into it, you didn't expect that there would be all these in, mm-hmm. intense side effects. So was this an outlier situation? Something that they didn't? I think it it was an outlier situation. Um, I think uh, you know, I medicine is is difficult. I. The people doing my therapy were also my friends and they actually wanted me to get this treatment. So I wonder uh, sometimes in the nicest way, whether they, they didn't tell me about everything or maybe I didn't hear. I only heard what I wanted to hear, which sometimes happens as a patient. Um, so, but I know some of the things, especially the nausea was a unusual side effect. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and again, yeah. with everything, it's an N of one, but it is good to understand what people go through. I think the biggest takeaway, Robin, from this part of it is you, um, I don't know if rock star feels right, but having gone through so much in such a short period of time, again, um, you know, you, you, you maintained, it seems this attitude of, well, I'm going to keep going. And yeah, this is what well, it and is. The key was, is I actually, um, I had to go back to work right after chemo, right after radiation. So I went back to work, uh, three months after my bone marrow transplant and just a week after radiation. So um, I, 
I had a, I would go to Smoothie King in the morning and I'd get one of these massive Smoothie King things with like protein powder and I would just take it to work. And, um, okay. So hopefully people have a smoothie center nearby. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think it's the most healthy thing and there'd be some, there's going to be someone there. Oh, there's too much sugar. There's too much. I said, at this point I needed calories yep. and I would have some protein and I could drink that all day long. Yeah. And also about head and neck radiation. I, um, I have to admit, I did get an alternative therapy. I had acupuncture. Uh, it's been some studies. If you have acupuncture in your salivary glands, that it actually helps uh, promote the return of your salivary gland function. And I had that done. I think it helped. Uh, I know it didn't hurt. Well, it was uncomfortable, but I was willing to do whatever I could to return to a normal life. And I also kept walking. I wasn't able to do much physically at first, um, but I would walk around. I would, you know, walk one block, then I would walk a mile. I'd walk two miles, three miles. I gradually worked up to that to try to maintain my muscle mass and my functionality. Thank so it so was much. a determination for sure. Yes, determination. You did the physical exercise, movement, integrative medicine with acupuncture. Um, yeah. and smoothies. Um, so thank you, Robin. Actually, I think we're going to now, you know, divvy this up into a third segment. Right. <clears throat> so, um, hang tight. We're going to go into a very big topic, of course, which was your second relapse and the CAR T trial that you underwent. Mm -hmm. 